Hello, everyone. This is Mary Kate Saliva here with you, host of Veteran Voices in partnership with Military Women's Collective over with Marina Rabinek doing great things over there. And also with the Guam Human Rights Initiative where you can find more about them at guamhri.org. This streaming Veteran Voices is part of the Supply Chain Now family where you can tune in wherever you get your podcasts from. Really excited to kick off this year with an incredible guest and dear friend of mine and amazing also Navy veteran. He served over 20 years in the United States Navy, and he wears numerous many hats, but he's also assistant vice president over at Bank of America and also does incredible work on the board of directors with Operation New Uniform. So if you join me in welcoming David Trenholm, thank you so much for joining me today, David. Hey, Mary Kate. Happy to be with you today. Yeah, I'm super excited. I was like, who am I going to talk to next on Veteran Voices? And as some of our return listeners know, or maybe our new listeners don't know, this podcast is about interviewing veterans who are continuing to serve beyond the uniform. And, you know, I was sticking my head together with Marina Rabinick, founder of Military Women's Collective. And I was like, who should we interview next? And, she, and we we're like, David, got to get David on the list. So David, here you are sitting here so I can, um, you know, pick your brain and share with the world some more about you. So I love kicking off the show with some pep, some motivation, <laughs> get everyone caffeinated this morning with a favorite motivational quote. So I hope you have one ready. Do you have a favorite motiv motivational quote you'd like to share with us? Uh, maybe not a quote, but, um, you know, one of my biggest things is, is uh uh, the SEAL Admiral, you know, did a speech at a college and, you know, when he talked about is, is setting goals for each day and, you know, number one, make your bed, you know, start up every day, get that yes. first goal done, you know, and, and, and knock that off the list and then continue to building, you know, and achieve, you know, knocking out goals every day. Oh, I love that. I actually, gosh, I've seen that speech before and it's really moving, but I think he got me on this traction of let's make my bed every morning. And then I'm just disappointed when I look at it because I do think about that um, and just something that simple. And I think this past year, I heard a lot of folks saying small wins, small wins. And that wasn't something that I really um, under, understood or really thought to, to think about as much until this past year, like coming out of the pandemic, people were like, we just want to get small wins. And I think something as simple as making your bed, you're like, that's your small win for the day and come back and like, I accomplished something. So definitely love that. And, you know, not that we're going to go way, way back. You know, sometimes I feel like I end up dating my veterans when I say how many years they serve. But <laughs> I want to take our listeners back to a time when, where you grew up. And if you could share a little bit about uh, where you grew up and some of those uh, lessons learned there, sort of a moment in time. So I grew up in uh, Rockford, Illinois, um, second largest city in Illinois, in Illinois. But I mean, that's not saying much. It's probably about 200,000 compared to Chicago, which is, I don't know, seven and a half, eight million. Um, yeah. So large city feel. Uh, I grew up, my mom worked in a factory for 20, 30 years uh, herself, if not more. My dad worked, you know, a lot of jobs like lumber yards, factories, odd jobs, um, working for themselves, you know, and so I, I really grew up with a lot of blue collar roots, um, you know, but I knew I wanted more in life. I wanted to see the world. I wanted to get an education. And I came from, you know, typical middle class family that lived paycheck to paycheck. And the only way I saw myself, you know, you know, moving up in, in the world was to join the military because I wasn't smart enough and I wasn't athletic enough to get scholarships um, and, and getting college uh, loans didn't entice me. So, you know, at the uh, young age of 17, I enlisted in the Navy, uh, went off to uh, Great Lakes, also known as Great Mistakes uh, for boot camp. <laughs> um, you know, and, and uh, I enlisted as a yeoman, um, did really well. I, you know, Went in as an E1. I made E2 out of boot camp as an honor grad. You know, uh, 
made E3, timing worked out perfect, so I could take my first test for E4, made it on first try. So I went from E1 to E4 in a year and a half. Um, you know, and about another six months later, I applied for an officer program, um, which was called um, Boost, Broad and Opportunity for Officer Selection and Training. So which is a Navy prep school for uh, college for those in the Navy and Marines that you know, have the aptitude, but maybe didn't have the grades to get into college. I, th- I think I've know, I know a, a few folks that went through through Boost. Is um with regards to your family, since you grew up in a much smaller town, like you said, comparatively to Chicago, uh, was was your family very supportive of you joining? Did you have you come from a generational line of veterans and those yep, who served- yep. So I am uh I am third generation at least uh, Navy. Um, so my grandfather uh, did a couple of years during World War II. My dad did a couple of years during Vietnam. Um, so when I was going through my selection process, I immediately knew I was either gonna go uh, Marines or Navy. Um, and I kind of went Navy because they guarantee a job. Uh, I went in and said, hey, I wanna do either something business or, or uh, computers. They told me to be a young man, you'll work in an office. It's like business, it's completely lied to me. You know, typical recruiter stuff. Um, you know, I spent- well, you know, I'm army, David. So I was just like, gosh, you didn't. That wasn't even on the table for you to go in the army. You're like, nope, Marines or uh, Navy. So there wasn't a big uh, shiny billboard that got you, or any recruitment posters or videos. No, I just I really like the idea that you know my grandfather served in the Navy, my dad served. Um, I, I thought it'd be really cool to, to create a legacy of being, you know, third generation to all enlist the Navy. Uh, you know, and as you can see kind of behind me, it's, you know, pictures up behind me is my, my grandfather, you know, my dad and me all in our boot camp photos. Oh, that's uh, great. I see you all there in your, in your uniform. Yeah. Mm-hmm. With that hat. Gosh, should we call it like the Popeye uniform or the, no, the Cracker Jack <laughs> uniform? <laughs> it, that is the Cracker Jack with the uh, Dixie cups. Yes, with the Dixie Cups. All right. So for those who are audio today and not visual, yeah, that's yeah, that's the uniform that they're wearing up there on the wall. That's great. But I love, I'm very much into family history and love that legacy piece that you have um, for your family. And was that something that they were able to, to witness you come in across a, a basic training? Were they there? Uh, yeah, so my uh, my parents all came. I mean, the good thing is I live 45 minutes away from boot camp. So I actually had, I don't know, 15, 20 people. So my parents were there, my best friends from high school, um, you know, my girlfriend at the time. You know, I had, you know, a lot of good friends there uh, that were able to attend. Um, I don't remember if my grandparents were able to come or not, um, but you know, having them all there was, was huge. Uh, they always had all their support. Everybody was so proud of me, um, you know, for stepping out and, you know, doing something different because, you know, 99% of all my friends, I would say probably 95% of them never left home. You know, they, oh, they wow. stayed local. Um, you know, the lot, most of them have done really great things. Um, mm-hmm. but I, I wanted to see the world. I wanted to get an education and, I really had, a, 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 you know, the other thing is I really believe in all the American beliefs, the Constitution and all that, and I wanted to be able to defend it, you know, so that everybody has the right to do what they want, say what they want, whether I agree with it or not. No, I absolutely. I, I mean, that's just such a beautiful thing. And I appreciate that so much more when I'm when I go and visit other countries, just a reminder again about why we serve, whether that was at peacetime or during war. So thank you so much for sharing that piece. You talk about with your dad's relationship and like the support there. I'm curious to any lessons learned, <laughs> uh, as, you know, as a young man going into the Navy, you know, your third generation, do you have, it? were there any lessons learned that you took with you, um, basic training and the early phases of your career? So the biggest thing was, I mean, it really helped was coming from a blue collar family. You know, my, my grandparents, you know, were farmers at one point and then moved on to, you know, other things, but, mm-hmm. you know, having that blue collar mindset hit the grindstone, you know, work really hard, um, you know, and it, and it wasn't hard 
to excel and be noticed. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons I promoted quickly. It's one of the reasons I got selected for the officer program. You know, it's one of the reasons I got selected to fly as a naval flight officer in the back of the P3 Orion. You know, I was, I've never been the smartest. I've never been the fastest, never been the strongest. But my work ethic is you will not, you know, I'm, that, that whole tortoise and hare thing. Like you will not, you will beat me off the line, but I will finish, you know, no matter what. I just have like the visual there. I mean, if, even if you have to low crawl across that line, I'm still going to make it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I might not finish first, um, but I'm not going to finish last. And, and I will finish. Your quote was so much nicer than mine. I've always said, like, I may not be the strongest or the fastest, but I'm not the dumbest. That's what I'm like. <laughs> oh, my God, I can do this. So, no, I think that's fantastic. And it's just, again, where... My, I remember early phases of my military career, I always kept hearing the expression of it takes a village. I don't know about it takes a village to raise Mary Kate, but it takes a village to help. You know, I, I was standing on the shoulders of those who came for me and it was just such an incredible legacy. But I, I just was really curious about, about that aspect. But again, coming from a blue collar family, hard worker, hardworking. Tell us about now that you're, you know, you rock star promoted really quickly. Now you're in the boost program. It was, it, where was the, where was boost at by the way? So boost for me was up in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, Newport, originally it, was, okay. it was originally in San Diego, California. Uh, but sometime in the early nineties, they, they moved it up to Newport, Rhode Island. So I spent a year up there. It was probably one of the hardest years of my life. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. But it's beautiful up there in Newport. Did you get to have any sailing? Oh, it was amazing. But I was, I was also up there in, was it 99, uh, 98, 99, you know, I got stuck in Chicago during, you know, the blizzard, the only second blizzard ever to, you know, shut down O'Hara airport. Um, you know, so it was super cold that year. Right. Um, of course and, it was. Perfect, but, perfect timing. I mean, it was beautiful, but like, um, so while we were at Boost, we studied pretty much math, science, and English. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was always on the uh, extracurricular, I shouldn't say extracurricular, the, uh, I always had to spend extra time in class, uh, you know, because my, uh, my, I lacked in the English department um, a lot. So mm -hmm. I was, you know, had to spend two extra hours every day doing extra training, extra reading and everything. Like I said, I wasn't always the smartest, but I always eventually got there. Um, I didn't, I didn't graduate in the top of class, I actually kind of graduated down near the the bottom uh, of the class, but I graduated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's probably wasn't my best performance ever. Um, but that kind of changed once I actually got to college because the, the, the things we did there really prepared me and prepped me for college. So that schooling was very hard for me, which in turn, college became very easy for me. You know, I barely passed calculus at, at, uh, at the, at boost with like a, a low c but when i went to college because everything they they taught me there i was passing with high a's at college um you know so it, it seriously prepared me it was really hard um it was kind of it's kind of more like a uh, a high school aspect where it was you know monday through friday every day having class unlike college which is you know two days a week three days a week a couple hours here a couple right. hours there um but it really prepared me to help set me up for success because I went to, I uh, ended up going to Florida A&M University for the first two years full time before now transferring to Florida cool. State. Change of weather and scenery for you, but yeah, definitely going to, to Florida State. I, I am curious because coming from the enlisted side as an, as a non-commissioned officer, your, your pathway from enlisted to an officer program, do you think that 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 helped at all or prepare you at all comparatively to other officers that you saw came straight in and, and never, uh, and they were not prior enlisted. Did you see a, a difference there? Absolutely. So I had, I mean, I had over four years. Um, so when I did get my commission, I was an O&E. Um, so an officer with over four years enlisted experience, I felt it gave me a lot of better rapport with, with my, my sailors um, you know, I spent more time around my sailors than I did in the officer's mess, uh, which in some ways hurt me, maybe a little bit politically, but my teams always did the, 
did the best because I showed my team, like, look, I care about you. I'm around you. Um, you know, one of my later tours, I was actually on the uh, USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, and I was the what's called the OI division officer. So I was in charge of uh, about 95 operations specialists um, and a couple other rates. And, you know, by the time I left, they're like, we've never had a division officer spend as much time around you. Like, usually you see them in the morning or you'd see them once a week. I was around them constantly. Like, I would go down and play cards with them. I would, you know, I tried to show them that I cared. I was around them, you know. It's not just about the mission. It's about the people. It's about, you know, what's going on with their families. You know, we're deployed, you know, it's hard to get a hold of family. You know, what's going on? What, what makes you tick? What's going to help ease your pain so that, you know, you can focus on the mission and you're not worried about, you know, the spouse at home paying a bill or the car broke down or, you know, the dishwasher, all the Murphy's laws that happened. It happened to my wife. My wife, you know, every time I left was either in an accident or the walk the dishwasher broke or, okay. you know, something happened that my wife had to take care of things while I was gone. Well, and I, it, it's it makes such a huge difference. The fact that I'm sure that you knew their names too. I mean, when you just mentioned about the number, it you, you take on all these people and some may see it as like, I just took on like 90 new problems, but and as you said, Murphy's Law, all that, that what you just said about with your wife, that's the definition of Murphy's Law right there. But um, th the fact that you took the time to get to know them and for them to see you, and I am a huge believer in approachable leadership and just making that time, taking that time. And we see that, I, I really do feel that we see that on the enlisted side to have you sitting there, even though the rank, you know, they, they say, well, respect the rank but really respecting the individual goes a long way so I love that you did that and they saw the difference so I, I really wanted to to ask you too about a favorite place that you were I don't I know I talked to some veterans and they never left <laughs> they were at the same duty station like their whole career but just I, I know a lot more so with my Navy veterans that you all do end up traveling all over the place so just really curious about if you have a favorite uh, place that you served at or even if it was temporary. So some of the favorite places I served, um, you know, and, and of course they're all air force bases. Were they? Uh, of course they were better food too. Yep. Yep. So, uh, I spent probably nine months total over three different deployments in uh, Kadena air force base in, uh, Okinawa, Japan. Um, I just love the people, the culture, you know, and the missions we were flying. Um, you know, I flew in the P-3 Orion, which was a mixed crewed aircraft. So we had five officers, six enlisted, you know, which also goes back to the way I treated my people. Because, you know, when we went on deployments or detachments, you know, perfect example, we went to Thailand. We took our maintenance debt with us. So we loaded up our plane with, you know, five maintainers and a corpsman, um, you know, flew them and parts all the way down there. Um, you know, we're living in the same location together. You know, we're working together. Um, even the aviators are down helping the, the, the mechanics at times uh, when needed. Um, you know, and so out of Japan, I got to go to go see a bunch of other things. And I just I just love that. Um, but I would say probably for mission satisfaction, uh, I spent a lot of time in uh, Insulik, Turkey. Uh, we we're flying missions. You know, for the first half of the missions, we were flying overland Turkey, looking into Syria, supporting, you know, ground troops. And then the second half, we were actually flying overland Iraq and and, uh, wow. and Syria missions. You know, I got to be there as I got to see the caliphate um, fall, um, you know, wow. as we eliminated it. And, uh, you know, being a part of that and being in support of our troops on the ground, you know, not, not a better feeling than, than seeing seeing uh you know us accomplish our mission gosh i i'm like really wanting to go that sounds like an entire um movie right there just in in that moment um at that time is that something would you say is probably one of your most memorable for you in, in your navy career absolutely because you know those ones especially uh out of insulic and actually we did the other half of the missions out of bahrain Mm -hmm. Um, now I was the officer in charge of a group of 
it was a small detachment of about nine people, you know, and we rotated flying and supporting a, a squadron, you know, and so we were flying on average every other day. Um, you know, I think every month I got, I don't know, about 18 flights every, or uh, 15 to 18 flights. Every flight is, is a 10 hour mission. Um, you know, we're given at least four to six hours of support to, you know, targeting intel gathering reconnaissance you know a different bunch of different um you know support and uh you know the the best part was is we actually got to talk to the chaos you know and find out what's the mission why are we doing this and then i got to be on a bunch of uh you know, Zoom type calls with people mm -hmm. on the ground and they would actually tell us, hey, you, you did great here. You, you need to improve there. You know, so we were actually hearing, you know, very quick, real time. Feedback, you know, near real time feedback of what support we were providing. No, and, that, and that's great. Like whether, whether it was good or bad, but like you said, for the good and just such an incredible feeling. And I love that even though, I think aviation gets that misconception that there's not so much about the team. You know, you think like even the army or the Marine Corps, there's like a lot of like on the ground team. But then when you're up in the air, you're like, is there a bunch of, is there an aspect of team that goes into that? Um, but, you know, just in, in your story there, there's a lot that goes in and that communication is critical and so important. I, I know that we talked about like why you joined the military, but I'd say that even fewer end up staying 20 years and even 20 years and some days after that, right? Um, so what is it that kept you to stay? Is that that aspect of, of team or why did you stay in for as long as you did? So a lot of it, you know, evolved over time. So did four years enlisted, becoming naval flight officers, an eight-year commitment after winging. So that really is 10 years. So at that mm -hmm. point, I'm at 14 years. I now have a wife and two kids. Um, I'm in, I'm, for the most part, I love my job. You know, most of my time I actually spent flying. I it was 12 years before I saw my first Navy ship, uh, which I get made fun of a lot. I was like, "How are you in the Navy and never see a ship?" I was like, "Well, my <laughs> airplane's big and it doesn't land in aircraft carriers." Um, but you know, at that point, you know, priorities start changing. You're like, "Hey, I'm only six years away." You know, retirement. You know, is not that far away. Um, at the time, I was still, you know on a uh, promotion scale, you know, to possibly become a commanding officer one day or even higher. Um, you know, and so I love the idea of leading. I love, I, you know, even when I retired at 20 years, I wasn't ready to retire. I was mm -hmm. still wanting to stay in longer, but I kind of, I didn't make a uh, commander. I got passed over, um, didn't make, make the last wicket. Um, so at that point they said, Hey, it's mandatory to retire at 20 years. Like, okay, I guess, I guess uh, I, I'm forced to leave. So, but what actually was a blessing in disguise. Um, you know, it was, it was very hard on me and my family. Uh, I did what three different times I did geographical bachelor tours. Oh, that's um, a lot. Sure. So early while my wife had a three-year-old or four-year-old and she was pregnant, I was in San Antonio um for an entire year and then i did two different tours while my kids were in middle school and high school up in norfolk virginia you know so i tried to keep i, I was kind of different my family didn't move around with me i tried to keep them stable so i don't know 2005 my family my wife and kids moved to jacksonville florida and they never left um so the only person that left was me so i had to do a two and a half tour up in norfolk came back for two years did, did another two years up there and came back and did my last tour in Jacksonville, Florida. So I, I was pretty much home-based. Most of my tours are in Jacksonville, Florida, but I did a bunch of other tours in different locations. And then, you know, I deployed to 15 different countries, did missions over another 15 or 20 more, you know, flying. So. Well, she sounds know, like I, an absolute rock star. That wife of yours, <laughs> your wife sounds amazing. Oh, she is. She, you know, she is my rock. Um, without her, I'd have never been able to do 20 years. You know, she's super independent. Um, you know, when Murphy hit, you know, 
she did 95% of it all by herself. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it literally took, you know, during one of our deployments, she actually passed out, um, you know, picking up our child at daycare. And that was, she was forced to, to get some help, um, you know, because she's, she's a super mom. She was going through college herself, working on her mm -hmm. associates. She had two small children. She was homeschooling. She was self-employed, you know, with a cleaning business, you know, and she was burning bo both candles, the candle at both ends while I was you right. know, deployed. And with some of that ad advice there, I'm sure you had like many mentors that took you under their wing during your military career, but I'm sure you've also passed on, on that knowledge. So, you know, ha what, what's your advice there on, on that, on having that rock, keeping that rock <laughs> strong? So, so I won't say I was perfect. I made a lot of mistakes early on that, that kind of hurt us, but you know, family is forever the military is only a small chapter in our lives. You know, even if you do 20 or 30 years, your, your family, you know, I've been lucky. I've been married over 20 years. Um, so most of my naval career, I've been, I was married to my wife, um, you know, and we're still married to this day. So, you know, Love that. don't my early on as a young, young, uh, Lieutenant, I, uh, I kind of put the Navy first before my family. Um, and I learned probably after doing that for about four or five years, that was the wrong way to do it. And I listened to seniors that always told me, it's like, look, family first, you know, mission second, um, when it comes to your family. Yeah. So great. Like the, and if, if someone has to think of it in a terms of mission, like mission first families taken care of. Um, and I, I, I'm happy to see that there is a, a sort of cultural shift now happening in the military as a whole, even though I still think we have a ways to go there, but I think there is a lot more emphasis in giving that time back to our service members to say, Hey, don't forget about your families. Like let's, you know, I love the work that a lot of the veteran service organizations are doing to include the spouses now as well, military and veteran spouses. Um, but as far as now, while that we're still on advice, if you were in, in a room full of transitioning service members, what would you say to them? Um, as far as advice in transition, I'm sure yours was a perfect transition, right, David? No, not at all. I had I had a lot of mentors, so my biggest my biggest suggestion is start early mm -hmm. and informational interviews. You know, because you'll never know what's out there and available to you until you start having conversations with people and get mentors that are not on active duty. You know, because we always tell ourselves, hey. Comp you know, as I always heard is companies will be knocking down doors to come hire you. You're a veteran, you're a rock star, everybody's going to launch you. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. You know, really it comes down to is networking, you know, getting your name out there with companies of interest, you know, finding out what, what's available, you know, and then kind of gearing your resume after you figure out what you want to do towards the career path you want to go. No, I love that. And I, I mean, that's how we met as well was through a veteran mm -hmm. service organization, networking, helping yep. service members transition. I was still trying to figure it out. I still feel like after over a year, I'm still transitioning. <laughs> and I heard that that feeling is normal. So I'm like, what am I going to figure it out? But, you know, we, we met for, for, through that. So I think that's fantastic advice to start early and to network because you don't know what you don't know, as cliche as that sounds. And I've I, I've grown so much, learned so much, um, even even from you about what's possible, and what's out there. So um, with regards to for those who are just listening audio, can't see your incredible new uh, blue collared shirt here with Operation New Uniform ONU. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit about that and how, how you got started after over 45,000, as they say, veteran service organizations nationwide and you're with Operation New Uniform. Tell us more about that. So Operation New Uniform uh, is another transition assistance program um, that is, you know, it's BSO style. So it's Veterans Service Organization. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, while I was getting out, that was the other thing I would tell people is, you know, attend as many different TAP type courses as possible. Um, you know, I, I attended a couple others. I attended Operation New Uniforms. Um, and what really helped me is you know, they, they, they focused on the mental aspect of transitioning. 
you know, because once we leave the military, you know, you're taking off your uniform, you're losing your rank, your ribbons, your titles, you know, and, and really they, they helps you understand who you are as a person, as a valued member of society, as a father, as a husband, you know, you know, and what you do. And so half of it was kind of the mental aspect of learning, like I am somebody. And then the other half is nobody better prepared me for the interviews than they did because mm -hmm. their entire cap course is built around the Sandler training system. So the Sandler training system is, is, is a sales course that people go through for an entire year. Well, we kind of got the uh, truncated, you know, two and a half weeks course. And what did I do? I learned how to sell myself in an interview, you know, while building up my confidence and then giving me a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, interview techniques, you know, I got to the point where I was now interviewing companies just as much, if not more than they were interviewing me for the roles, you know? So now I'm really into what's culture fit. All right. So, Hey, this is great. You're going to pay me a lot of money but are you going to be a good company? Are you going to be a good boss? Like, do I see a, a, me fitting into this, into the role, into the company? Um, you know, so. I think that's huge. That's huge. Finding the right culture fit. Right. And I think sometimes we focus too much on the pay. I mean, I've spoken to like dozen service members that are transitioning right now, but still on active duty. And they're like, what can I, what can get me that six figure salary? Like yep. you said, just being able to ask those questions in interview, you have to know, especially during the interview, when they ask you, do you have any questions for me? I, I find that that stumps a lot of service, a lot of veterans about just, we don't, we're not used to getting asked our opinion or what, what we want. Um, this is the time, right? To, to ask and say what you want. Well, that, that section right there of asking the company questions, that could be the make or break between getting job hired or not, because they want to know, number one, are you enthusiastic about joining the company? Or are you just like, hey, I need a job? Like mm -hmm. nobody wants somebody on your team that just wants a job. Like I want you on the team because you think our mission's amazing at the company. Uh, the position's amazing. It's going to help you grow, um, you know, or, or, you know, what's a day in the life? You know, what, what, what should I expect in my first 30, 60, 90 days? You know, um, you know, what, what, it, what does five years look like for somebody in my position joining your company? You know, so our, they're trying to see is like, is this person just going to come in, you know, turn a wrench and do the same turning of that wrench for five years? Or are they going to look to, you know, expand their knowledge? You know, a lot of companies want somebody that is a lifelong learner. Yeah. They want a lifelong learner and a team player. And if it's all about, I think that was the, this, the thought just crossed my mind, especially since you're a Navy veteran, but I heard like, even for those coming out of the Naval Academy that want to be SEALs, like they have to go through an interview process. Like they don't just take them just because they're a PT stud or good at physical fitness. Like they actually interview them. And I, I recall like this one guy did not get selected because he was so arrogant and so full of himself during the interview. And I remember hearing that from his peers saying that that's why he wasn't picked is that they could tell in the interview that he wasn't a genuine person and he would be near impossible to work with, like as a team player. And since he wasn't, I so said he was just in it for himself. So that's, again, that's such a critical piece to identify is it a right culture fit but knowing how to to go about asking those questions and the other big one I get from from service members transitioning is where do I start and so does um operation uniform do they hold events or how does how does one get a hold of, of operation uniform so um they were pretty much local in Jacksonville Florida and, and in Tampa but they do take in online people but they actually just opened up they're going to start their very first completely virtual uh cohort here in 2023. Oh that's um, great. How they, how they can get a hold of them is onuvets.org. Um that's their website. Uh you can see the classes what they provide. Um they go to events, they just they do some job fairs. You know, they advertise on LinkedIn, um, mm -hmm. you know, of course. And then, um, you know, there is an apply button. You know, you just apply. Um, the nice thing about ONU, unlike some of the TAP courses I've seen, um, they only take somewhere between 12 to 15 people per cohort. 
you know, because they're, they're more caring about you getting a career than a job. So they're not about churning out numbers. They're right. more getting a little bit more one-on-one um, with each student, trying to help them with their goals. You know, and the nice thing is, you know, they've been going on, they've been doing this for about six years now that they're very well networked already in the city. So, you know, you say, Hey, I want to go work at company X. Oh, well, we have three graduates and we also know the hiring manager over there. You know, so I, I, th- I don't remember the, the number off the top of my head, but I mean, they've had probably around 500 graduates. They've done 51 or 52 classes already. Um, you know, Graduate so- piece is something that I love so much too, because in, in the programs that I went through during my transition, I still have access to all the alumni that went through that program. So all the other cohorts, it's like, even though we didn't go through the same cohort, if I put out there that I'm looking for somebody who understands life insurance within like 30 minutes, I'm going to have like dozens of responses from, from other veterans who went through other cohorts. And it's just so great, right. To have that piece. So even like you said, even if it's, you only have a dozen people in one cohort, you have 500 other veterans who also understand where you've been from and they're part and like I said about how you said Florida, I just love that they're starting to to, to grow that out and build that. Uh, so you have folks in all different industries, walks of life, but to know that you're not going through it alone, right? That big piece. So again, well, for those you. listening, onuvets.org, right? Onuvets.org. That's correct. Right. And, and, and especially they, they pivoted just like everybody else did um, during the COVID time. And that's when they started doing a lot more of the virtual. So, I mean, we've had, they've had students um, all the way from Seattle, Washington, to Texas, to Norfolk, Virginia, to, you know, out in California virtually, Um, you know, and and we actually had there a couple that were so dedicated that they came to Jacksonville, you know, because we partner, they also partner with other veteran service organizations. So they partner with Wounded Warrior Project to help, you know, get housing for people that are out of state to come in if they want to do in person. Right. No, and I I think that's huge because I'm finding that they're not all VSOs, veteran service orgs will help all eras of veterans. Yeah. Is that the case for Operation Uniform? Do they take anybody or is it just post 9-11 veteran? Nope. So the nice thing is they'll take anybody. So we're not talking. Oh, that's great. You know, um, you know, they've done a couple of people that were Vietnam veterans that have been out for 20 years. Um, you know, you don't have to be that. within a six month or a one month, one year window on front or back end. Uh, they don't care about, you know, rank. They don't care about degrees, you know. So the nice thing is, is it really comes down to, you know, are you interested in the program? Because, you know, they they are a little bit selective. They actually they actually do a, an interview process. You know, they want to make sure you're the right fit. You're at the right mindset, you know, that you're teachable. You know, because if you're not teachable, they don't want to waste their time, you know, That's with great. somebody who's like, well, nope, it's going to be my way or the highway. I'm like, well, then why are you coming to the class? Right. And, or the, like, I already know everything, so you can't teach me anything new, right? So with, I know you're on the, the board of directors and longtime volunteer. Is it, how would somebody go about volunteering or what sort of support would, would you say ONU needs now? Uh, of course, number one is financial support. Because the nice thing is, is mm-hmm. not a single veteran is charged a dime to go through the program. It's, it's, great. it's all that. done through fundraising. Um, there is a little bit of state funding, um, but, you know, number one donations, they have a loyalty, loyalty brigade. So somebody can give, you know, as minimal, small as $10 a month if they want, or they want to do a one-time donation. Um, outside of that, um, they're always putting on events. So some of the fundraising events, you know, they always need volunteers for, they do a, a clay shoot in the springtime. And we just did a heroes gala, uh, this past fall. And we just had the, uh, Lieutenant Colonel retired Alan West as our guest speaker. Oh, that's, Brian, that's great. And along with uh, Brian Kilmead was our uh, guest MC. Oh, that well, you got some rock star legends in their own right there. I, I, no, I think that's fantastic. And just to, you know, in case our, any of our listeners want to get involved, you know, it's onuvets.org. Uh, financial support. Again, I love that they're not having to pay, but, you know, just to, to know that even a small donation, it does add up to ensure that these uh, transitioning service members and, and veterans have that opportunity to succeed in whatever pathway they're they're going through. So 
Thank you so much, um, David, for your time today. I wanted to see if there, you had any final last thoughts for our listeners. Some may be going through transition. Some may be out for a long time or have been out for a long time. Some may just be a supporter and, and just love uh, the military veteran community and just want to see how to get involved. So do you have any, any last thoughts or words for our so listeners? The biggest thing is, I mean, especially if somebody has been out for a while, you know, and they want to mentor, there's, there's probably three great mentor networking opportunities. You know, you always have ACP American corporate partnerships is where you do a one-on-one for one year, a mentorship program with a veteran. Yes. Uh, another one is is Veterati. Veterati is kind of an a la carte. You can have one conversation with a veteran. You can have a hundred conversations with a veteran. Um, you know, and that's a great way where I learned a lot of you know clearing out that fog of war and learning about different things by just talking to random people, you know, in companies and learning about my skills. And then of course the last one is Vets to Industry with you know Brian Arrington and everything he's doing with with Vets to Industry. Every three weeks, they're doing a uh, networking event that with the keynote speaker, um, you know, you're getting breakout rooms, you know, you're, you're they're combining together veteran service organizations, employers slash recruiters, and, you know, those looking for employment. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's three hours, mm-hmm. but you're, you're talking, their attendance is anywhere from 300 to 500 people. So you want to increase your network, that's 300, 300 to 500 quality people you can network with and to I meet that remember. linkedin threshold right of 500 connections um, yep. but i love that brian started the the pacific uh networking time frame too for i i know i'm probably betraying the name of that but i love that they started the pacific times and one now too so our service members our listeners who are tuning in from that side of the world you can you know the, just great opportunities there that you're not forgotten that, you know, we want to be able to help you transition, even if you're stationed overseas. So, and, and Brian also does the one with the military spouses at Vets Industry too. So I love that they do the, the spouse mixers and that's how we met David was through Vets Industry and um, just incredible uh, virtual library there to see even by state you can filter. So you could look up Florida, see the great organizations there that are giving back um, and here to support you as uh, veterans and military families and but thank you so much for for bringing that up the networking piece the mentorship piece huge very pivotal to this your success um so thank you i wanted to see if, if any listeners want to get a hold of you what would be the the best way that they could reach you uh best way to reach me is just you know find me on linkedin it's you know david trenholm uh just my name uh you know, I usually do that. And then once we connect, you know, we'll do a conversation via Veterati for the, you know, to figure out because everybody's, everybody's transition is different. So I always like to have a conversation like, what is your goal? What is your timeline? You know, what are your interests? Because not everybody's interested in the exact same thing, you know? So it's, it's Very really true. every transition is, is kind of an a la carte, you know, and, and specialize, you know, don't compare yourself to somebody else's transition. You know, because their careers, their goals, you know, you know, what they were striving for are going to be different than what we strive for or that I strive for. No, that's absolutely true. And there is no cookie cutter way. I think that's why you got to take it with a grain of salt. Like when people are marketing what they have available, you know, don't don't self-select out of an opportunity, especially like I get to my other enlisted brothers and sisters that think, oh, that's just for officers or I don't have a college degree. So that doesn't, you know, I, they're not going to want to look at me and, you know, just don't self-select, give yourself that opportunity to learn and to just take each opportunity is, it is so unique, right? So, and for those, um, again, it's more audio visual, it's T-R-E-N-H-O-L-M, for David's last name, Trent Holmes. So just so you can find him on LinkedIn, connect and uh, grow your network. Uh, So thank you so much, David, for tuning in today here on Veteran Voices. And for all of our listeners, thank you again for supporting us and for our new ones. Hopefully you'll come back and hear more about veterans who are continuing to serve beyond the uniform and doing great things. And as you can In our partnership, again, with the Guam Human Rights Initiative and Military Women's Collective, you can check out more and learn from those two great nonprofits and what they're doing there. And also Supply Chain Now Family, which is part of Veteran Voices, part of the Supply Chain Now Family. And you can get that wherever you get your podcasts. So do good, 
be the change that's needed in our world today as we kick off the new year. Thank you again, David, and we will see you all next time.